Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today, we're starting off with our year-end list. And let's start with what will inevitably be the most popular, the top 10 worst hit songs of 2021. At first, I seriously question whether even making this list made sense. And I'm not saying this for the expected reasons like, oh, it's been a hard year, the negativity is overexposed, it's tired, focus on the positive, it's not worth getting all that agitated over a couple bad songs. And for as much as that tends to be true, that was not my issue with 2021. No, 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 it's in that word, hit. And it circles back to why critics like myself make year-end lists focusing on the hits. Because they're the popular songs that people might recognize. They've got some level of cultural ubiquity. Even if in the age of cheap virality, it's never guaranteed to last. But the whole concept of hits, especially as defined by Billboard... It's a construct, one that I've always been aware of and I've been faintly annoyed with ever since the first year where a song might have fallen short because of arbitrary weighting of sales or radio or streaming or Billboard's increasingly wonky cutoff date. But never did it feel more artificial than in 2021, which felt historically reminiscent of the mid-90s and the level of record label chart manipulation by exploiting loopholes and weaponizing fan bases to chase statistical feats that felt increasingly flimsy even within the context of history that's something that a lot of these fan bases never seem to understand that the more they try to bend or break the rules to bolster their statistical success the more they undermine that statistic so why on earth should i still care about how billboard defines a hit record in 2021 well i don't know call it vaguely aspirational and the desperate hope that someone at billboard reckons with all of this that they might close some of the loopholes or confront the reality of how their systems can be gamed and then leveraged in the popular consciousness for better or worse and if you're paying attention they've already been kind of tweaking the formula ever so slightly to do so or i don't know maybe it's just my own desire to remain consistent year after year or how in the broader scope of the hot 100 the most obvious gamesmanship it happens at the very top and the hits they don't just include that moreover when i realized that my underlying emotion towards a lot of the worst music of this year wasn't rage or disgust but rather a creeping deep-seated sense of embarrassment it kind of made sense that i at least include some veneer of popularity in the conversation no matter how it's calculated after all in 2021 this is supposedly what the public wanted and always going off the songs that debuted on the hot 100 year-end list this year let's get it started with the dishonorable mentions i've got some famous friends you probably never heard of but back in rutherford county our crowd is sick and Oh yeah, the embarrassment's gonna start early with this one, as both of these men should absolutely know better than this. I swear to God, Chris Young used to make way better stuff than this. Even his bro country pivot in 2013 was solid. Instead, we got a song that doesn't make a lick of sense coming from these two. A weirdly insecure moment where given that they're now in the big city of Nashville and they're not as well known, they can point back and say, no, 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 we have famous friends back home too. And not only does the production sound so over-polished and programmed as to indicate how both trend chasing and how they fit just as much within Music Row, it can't even make sense on a conceptual level. Both these guys are established hit makers. Chris Young has been in the business since the late 2000s. Kane Brown was a viral sensation. Why even try to brag like this? If anything, it feels very unintentionally revealing of how quickly someone's star power can burn out in Nashville or how, really, they're still playing a version of a clout game. But again, neither of these guys should be doing this. Please stop. I was trying so hard to give Thomas Rhett a proper chance this year with his pivot towards more of a neo-traditional sound. And, and look, he's referencing all the old country songs of the past couple of decades. And that passes for saying something in another list-driven hookup song, right? I mean, Old Dominion tried this a couple years ago, and I didn't like it there either, because it's trying to appropriate nostalgia for a time and sound that Thomas Rhett isn't interested in selling. Especially when Dan Huff's production has turned the entire 
track into a blurry overprocess mess. Not only was I around for all of these better songs, the music your own dad made, Thomas Rhett, but a lot of the artists behind these tracks, they are still making music. In the case of Alan Jackson, with the same neo-traditional sound and doing it way better. But really... They can't even make this sound 90s with all the whooshing effects, unnecessary hand claps, gutless percussion, and overcompressed vocals. Lacking any commitment to its sincerity, it just sounds flimsy and phony. You could have pushed heaven right now, Thomas Rhett. And you could have pushed it a lot harder than you pushed this. You cut out a piece of me and now I bleed internally left it without you, without you. You know, I honestly thought this was going to wind up higher on my list, mostly because the only reason that the Kid Leroy is remotely close to the music industry is his connections and nepotism, riding the leftover wave of his connection to Juice World, then making the palest facsimile of his emo trap sound with a bog standard acoustic ballad that sounds like Post Malone's leftovers from 2016. But hey, even if this kid sounds like a total ass on the mic with his bad warbling falsetto and lyrics torn straight from a simple plan love song, I guess I understand the stripped down basics working effectively, how this sort of teenage melodrama might translate for a certain degree of intimacy, but this all breaks down with any degree of larger context. The fact that we needed a trio of industry veterans as co-writers and it still sounds hacked out in an afternoon, and while whinging bitch fests are dime a dozen, especially on the poppier side of emo trap, the only reason this became a hit stateside is because the radio needed the safest and whitest possible alternative. Songs this basic and amateurish, they don't deserve more attention. I'm begging, begging you to put your love in hand out, baby. I'm begging, begging you to put your love in hand out, darling. And here comes the backlash. Look, I've heard the other singles that are all better than this hacked out cover from 2017 before this band had fame, a budget, or Eurovision to propel them into the spotlight. But unfortunately, this is the draft that somehow got them famous. This was the hit. Almost reminding me a bit of how the demos of Your Love and Exo Tour Life were what blew up for Nicki Minaj and Lil Uzi Vert. But you know, even though I still don't really like either song, the central personality in the appeal of the artist kind of shone through, whereas this is a cover of a cover where Monoskin are trying to replicate the Madcon version of the Four Seasons original, and it sounds rough in the wrong way. The choppy guitars have no muscle, the drums sound like ass, the mixing gives nobody any firepower, and frontman Damien O. David, he sounds like he's singing through the worst vocal fry even possible. I don't know what sort of bog witch possessed his vocal cords, but his singing and faux rapping is not only very badly positioned within the mix, it feels like it's forcing a community theater grade of theatricality that the god-awful production only reasserts. Yes, I know, the band is better than this. This is the worst possible first impression. Oh, I know that some will be shocked this is not on the list proper, but folks, as someone who's been covering AJR for over four years now, Bang is middle of the pack when it comes to their catalog. They've done better, but my god, they've also done far worse. Now, this is still bad, and I won't hear otherwise. As much as I appreciate AJR trying to inch towards adulthood with the most embarrassing sentiments of what that actually means outside of early Lena Dunham, the production is still painfully flat. The uncanny valley of vocal mixing and pitch shifting gives me a splitting headache every time. The bombast has no serious punch to it, and any self-aware force zaniness only makes you realize that this aesthetic is not nearly as unique or special as AJR thinks it is. Especially in a year where 21 Pilots did exactly this same sense of creeping dread in the face of change way more effectively. What's a lot more surprising is that AJR did not launch more singles off the success of this, where even those who are responsible for perpetuating the backlash, uh, hi there, uh, we're just kind of sick of the discourse. It's not a bang, more of a whimper. Oh, 
Oh god. Just please stop. This is where the sense of embarrassment comes rushing back in earnest. Because both these acts should absolutely know better than to chase out this sort of hacked out, easy listening junk. Keith Urban, you can't just go back to making soft focus boyfriend country or something. Given the era you came up in, you're actually good at it. And Pink, the entire era of forward thinking pop rock you helped push in the 2000s, it's now back in style. How is Avril Lavigne beating you to the punch in that arena? But yeah, this was awful from the first listen, and the only reason it became a hit at all was the radio and residual name recognition. There's no chemistry. The clunky pop soul approach sounds like a bad leftover from 2017. The entire mix sounds canned and cheap. And the stumbling hangover hookup of a song, it leaves you with less romance than headaches and dry heaving. Can either of you find some forward-thinking management to get you away from pablum with the consistency of liquid shit like this? Both of you could actually stand for something in a 2000s revival. Not this. So let my eyes be your mirror And you're bound to see it too Cause I was made for loving just the way God made This was the moment where I realized that embarrassment was the underlying emotion of the worst of 2021. The majority of you don't remember who Parmalee are. I've actually reviewed them twice. They're C-list lifers on Music Row. They've been around since the early 2000s, but only catching their break in bro country in 2013 when they wound up on Stony Creek. And given that Nashville apparently had nothing else to push in early 2021, why not pair these guys with Blanco Brown and his one novelty song and who sounds genuinely genuinely embarrassed to be here, especially in some of the ad-libs. Probably just as much as me listening to this song. Not so much for the boyfriend country as the long-delayed, male-driven version of Raylan's God Made Girls. Complete with a little dash of little things by One Direction. Oh my god, all sorts of bad nostalgia coming back with this one. And while there is a part of me that kind of wants to be charitable because it sounds sincere, and they actually managed to get a hit here despite being produced by a member of Jason Aldean's road band with the beyond basic composition, the cheap hand claps, the sterile mix, and the slapdap fusion of filmy live drums and trap percussion. It sounds like this was made for the Hallmark Channel, with the most blandly shitty pop country sound I heard all year. Worse than Dan and Shay, even worse than Nico Moon, because at least good times sounded like coherent crap. And yeah, Parmalee... They've never been interesting. It's the reason that reviewing them is a real struggle. But when bands wind up producing this... I just feel sorry for everyone involved. Ugh. Smooth like butter, like criminal undercover. Don't pop like trouble, breaking into your heart like that. Okay. This is where I want to highlight how emotion factors into one's evaluation of a song. Because in theory, this isn't that bad. Sure, it's sterile, sloppily mixed, devoid of any sort of real punch, and BTS are being robbed of their personality to chase a Bruno Mars imitation from the mid-2000s, but, but, you could say it's lightweight. It's groovy enough, it shouldn't matter. And yet here is my problem. I could not listen to this song without being forcibly reminded of a month-long harassment campaign pushed by fans of this band who were livid, not in my opinion of the song, but on my reporting of the sales tactics used to juice the chart position, which included breaking ISRC rules and placing foreign currency to drive domestic sales buys. And that reached such a fever pitch, there was an article in Forbes about it. And I can congratulate the army about forever attaching an asterisk by music historians to Butter's chart run for this behavior, enabling Columbia to ignore any other avenues of promotion beyond sales where they just raked in the profits of stands chasing the position on a functionally meaningless hit parade in which BTS then changed labels. And they've now gone on hiatus, where Billboard's been surreptitiously tuning their own formula and cutting back on data transparency so this sort of stand behavior will be less likely in the future, and we're a month of flagrant abuse to a music critic and journalist pretty much killed my enjoyment of one of their biggest hits. Congratulations! You made everything worse, both short-term and long-term, for your own fandom, for anyone consuming Billboard, and music discourse at large. If I could have separated butter from all of that, I would have. But since art's subjective, and there's an emotional relationship here, I can't. And I won't. 
All right, that was a heavy moment. Let's move on to the garbage proper, starting off with number 10. So I've been saying it for years. I never outright hated Bro Country in the same way a lot of critics did. Like any subgenre, there's a spectrum of quality. And for as overexposed as the trend became, I always tried to give it a chance, and there was some good music there! Hell, I'll even stick up for the original Cruise by Florida Georgia Line. Yeah, it's dumb, but with Joey Moy's rollicking groove and the overblown production and a really good hook, I at least find it pretty fun. It goes off at karaoke. A lot less so the remix with Nelly, but that was more because the production hit the tipping point from overproduced to a disastrous but weirdly bland slurry. So clearly, we all needed round two of that, right? She says, hey, me to the country, show me where you're from. I said, Shawty, you gon' love me, and we gon' have some fun. I bring out my big wheel, and you can climb on up, girl. I think you a big deal, I show your boy some love. Just a little bit. I used to think that it was Sam Hunt dragging the zombified corpse of Bro Country forward in the horrible fusion of country and trap that highlighted the strengths of neither, but turns out, when both acts here need the hits really badly, this is what you get. A song that barely sounds finished that gets tacked on to both of their albums, which is a real note of desperation that I want to highlight here. But there's also this weird, sour emptiness to the song that for as stupid as everyone involved here could be, it's a lot uglier. The dated slang and frat braggadociousness where everyone leans harder on rap, where the guitar sounds tinny against the painfully cheap trap clunk, where minus Joey Moy's overblown sensibilities, Florida Georgia Line is stuck trying to merge a banjo into the hi-hat skitter, and the groove never builds any sense of power. And yet, aside from the undercooked production, and now nobody seems to be having any fun, which was the biggest saving grace of bro country, and the skeevy pushiness that was always the worst part of this subgenre, the line that pissed me off came from Nelly, calling himself the Black Tom Grady, he's the GOAT now. Now to go off a little on an extended football rant about how Tom Brady rode on the back of terrific defenses and special teams on the Patriots and the Bucks to say nothing of Bill Belichick's coaching with short fields and insane playoff luck to complement his statistical falloff during said playoffs and utterly unimpressive style of play where he could afford to take pay cuts and support the team because his wife is one of the most highly paid supermodels in the world. Let's focus on the micro here. Nelly's from St. Louis. For those of you who don't know, Tom Brady's first Super Bowl came against the St. Louis Rams and the greatest show on turf. If he had tried a line like this in the highly regional rap scene of the early 2000s, his city would have ripped him apart. That's how desperate he sounds in 2021. This is humiliation all the way down. Number 9. I feel like I wind up putting a song like this on my list every year. And while I mean it's deserving of it, I think I'm running out of things to say. Turn away all carbon beam, knock your legs off. Try to get away from me. Had to stand off. Hit him in the spot. Knock your dreads off. My what is it called about it? Because look, we've been down this road before. A relative no-name rapper snatches an okay beat and goes viral for one song, usually on TikTok, where you won't notice how he's saying nothing of interest. He gets a wealth of remixes behind him and a little bit of hype, and then it all disappears. Normally, whenever that tape trying to follow up on any of this surfaces to even less interest, and then the major label that signed him ran off with all the money, and somehow he can't get promo anymore. I mean, it happens damn near every year. At this point, it's depressing, especially when you realize how many other rappers hopped on Beatbox and would have gotten way more out of it beyond Spot 'em Got 'em with his weak Lil Uzi Vert and Young Thug impressions and really sloppy flow. And, and yeah, the flex is barely coherent. His one verse has him going to a party with another guy's girl and then ditching said girl for someone feeling on his Peter Bone. But the real issue is the production, where the bass is so clunky that it clips the piano, any other percussion, and his vocals. It's got a lot of SoundCloud rapper amateurishness, but none of the firepower to actually make more of it. And worse still, he's actually leaning in on the bad mixing on his follow-up songs that you have not heard. Trust me when I say you'll probably never hear them. Now, like most viral trends in this lane, you've probably already forgotten this exists. Number 8. 
So let's go back to that idea of embarrassment as a key emotion that's running through this year-end list, because I'll say it's a little odd in context, especially coming from me. I'm not the sort of guy who has much in the way of guilty pleasures or appreciating things ironically, which is where the conversation surround embarrassment normally comes up the most when discussing popular music. When it comes to negative feelings, though, a lot of it has to do with the public perception of how you might view an artist or their work, that you might have actually stuck up for them and then they do something so cringeworthy so embarrassing that you wind up regretting everything you said before and thus at the tail end of 2020 but landing on this list for 2021 we got this oh god running to the altar like a track star can't wait and the second there's a way you hold me oh me oh me oh me oh me feel so what I find oddly ironic is that this song reflects careers on two very different trajectories, with Justin Bieber in particular really turning things around for 2021, especially after his disastrous 2020. But while Yummy was gross and intentions and lonely were mismanaged to a hilarious degree, Holy really was the moment of Bieber's arc I thought his career was over, even despite as much as Americans love redemption. Because this is excruciating. Yeah, the production's a little messy, but it seemed to kind of work in providing some of that gospel swell, even if whenever the hip-hop percussion comes in, the song becomes unbearably clunky, which might as well be the running metaphor for every single problem with this. For one, Justin Bieber can't sell gospel or soul in his vocal range, and when he tries, it's not long before he's got lines like, Run into the altar like a track star! And he talks about the pimps and the players, and he references his old drama, and suddenly, I can't quite get away from how much of Bieber's Hillsong theology intersects with a capitalist prosperity gospel, and it sends me straight into the uncanny valley. It doesn't click. It's part of that side of American evangelicalism that makes my skin crawl. But you know what, even then, Justin Bieber's utter lack of convincing swagger could potentially work, and you know what, he did make better music this year, which I cannot say for Chance the Rapper. And oh god, as someone who stuck up for the big day, and his big Christian-themed wedding album, I think there are moments and ideas, I think that album got way too much hate. This song created the sinking feeling of questioning all the praise that I gave him. His verse is utterly corny in the worst way possible. Not the first inexplicable Vespa line, Line we're gonna get this year, but it wasn't as bad as the Joe Pesci line, or the Lionel Messi line, or the he made you a snack like Oscar Proud, which is a reference that barely works, and is somehow worse than all the God made girl sentiments from just the way. And somehow this hits the worst possible elements from Christian music. It's over sanitized in its piety, but trying way too hard to be cool with the kids. And as someone who was a track star in high school, I'm stuck between this and Mooski's bad song that'll just mix the list. God help us all. Number 7. So there used to be a trope with year-end lists where if there was a song that had a decidedly indie feel to it, normally got a lot of praise from critic types as being closer to the music that they already like and wish that they got more success on the charts. I can admit early on I was a little bit guilty of this, but as indie music became increasingly commodified, I've had a lot less luck in that arena. And even then, it's never been a consistent thing for me, even going back to the early 2010s. I'll stick up for mainstream pop as much as the underground, and there's no guarantee that good indie music becomes popular, and my opinion's not just about to change even when it's placed in context with the mainstream. For example, Sometimes all I think about is you Late nights in the middle of June E-Way's been faking me out Can't make you happy now I reviewed Dreamland back in 2020. That album is hot garbage over a year ago, and yet in 2021, Glass Animals' worst album produced the sleeper hit that's less psychedelic and more like heat stroke with a stomach virus. It's a song that makes me actively queasy every time I hear it. The blown out mix that somehow still feels weedy with the chalky drum machines and the hideous synth, the derivative ass pitch shifting and the trap elements, and Dave Bailey's over exaggerated squeaky vocal delivery where he goes for the pseudo spiritual hippie 
guru zonked out and on a lot of club drubs that he wants you to try. It's cloying in a way that immediately raises my bullshit detector, already stretched at the brink by a band that used to do interesting, if weirdly voyeuristic things with its sound, and that are now copying trends really badly, and it does not put me in a good place for a song all about mirages and misdirection, and is also a breakup song in the ugliest way possible. Yeah, there is a way to do the wistful, it's not you, it's me approach, something that the Jonas Brothers and Marshmallow actually kind of pulled off in a version of Leave Before You Love Me, and Bailey has described the song as being where you hit the brick wall, where you see yourself giving up all your personality to be with this person, and you gotta cut them loose just to save yourself. But that's not reflected in the content at all. You get the indication that the relationship has run its course and it's a swampy mix that sounds like a bad head cold, but there's nothing about him losing his personality or even as to much context to why it's ending, as he seems to regret seeing this person everywhere in his life. And by the second verse, guess what? He winds up nailing her one more time anyway, because you look so broken when you cry. I get the muggy stasis of the song is intended to imply and reflect his feelings, but in using the second person so much in the writing, it feels like the suffocation comes with a manipulative partner and all the false imagery really doesn't help. It feels gross and smarmy, the sort of song where none of that earnest emotion actually translates and it just feels hollow. Forget the heat wave. I'll take the cold snap. Number 6. I have been asked in the past why I don't talk about Eurovision in my videos. Because don't think I haven't thought about it, I actually used to blog about it a bit, and I know exactly how much traffic it could probably draw. But you know, if you've seen it, there's a lot about the competition that can kind of throw me. The nationalism, the weird voting blocks, the hyper-intense fandoms, the fact that like most singing competitions, it defaults to a lot of bland pageantry, which can give me very little to say as a music critic. And occasionally, something crosses over and it can be a mixed blessing at best. Sometimes you get acts like Monoskin, other times you get this. So this is a song from 2019, from singer-songwriter Duncan Lawrence from the Netherlands, who later saw this song go viral on TikTok late last year around the same time as the launch of his debut album. Funny how that tends to happen, which thanks to the slog of adult contemporary radio pushed this up the charts two years late. But even a few years removed does not hide how terrible this is, as it's now just dated. I saw posts go viral this year ripping a lot of the pop folk like the Lumineers and Mumford and & Sons for making stomp clap music and yet you gave this shit a pass? But even then, with the wispy backing vocals, this seems like it's trying to go for a slightly more gothic presentation against all the pianos, but the guitars clash really awkwardly on the pre-chorus, and none of it obscures how utterly awful Duncan Lawrence is for this material with his delivery. The central idea of the arcade as a metaphor for continuously chasing and failing at love, it had potential. The Veronica is actually the song from earlier this year called High Score that actually did this pretty well, but this feels like the sort of dingy arcade where you visit because there's nothing else to do at the mall and half the machines never work properly to begin with. Kinda doesn't work well for the whole small town boy in the big arcade, especially when said boy sounds so frail and nondescript as the lead. Give a song like this to Hosier, it might pick up some bombast, but it feels undercooked and clunky, not able to do enough with its central idea and not remotely able to sell a roller coaster of melodrama that it clearly needs. I'm honestly kind of shocked that this one Eurovision, given how paltry of a song it feels, because I think everyone else wound up losing. I want my time and my money back. Number five. But back to embarrassment. Okay, there was no way this wasn't making this list. I'm too sexy for this sir. Too sexy for your girl. Too sexy for this world. Too sexy for this ice. Too sexy for that jack. Yeah, yeah. One of the worst things about being a music critic with any knowledge of how it works behind the scenes is the phrase low quality music will seep into your mind where you can tell that nobody really cared to put that much effort in and the song's gonna coast by on names, birthright, the overdone music video and meme appeal 
and it's gonna become a hit. And that's not saying you need strenuous effort to make great music, or you can't catch quick lightning in a bottle, but at some point, call it what it is, this is lazy trash all the way down, where you can tell nobody even pretended to care about this. Hell, Young Thug sounds like he would rather be anywhere else, and I don't even think he had a good year here either. But this should be embarrassing for everyone involved. Let's be real. The milk toast percussion, the awful integration of the I'm Too Sexy sample with all the synthesizers, Drake dropping into Patois as if that wasn't tired five years ago, Future remaining as formless and lacking in intensity as always, when he's coasting where the non-effort it's the point because the joke is that they're not trying to be sexy but it's so over the drop in trying not to try so that's humor right I mean, when Eminem took this route in 2004, he was trying to deliberately destroy his career. When Drake, he's so comfortable that he's got the hit, he doesn't even have to pretend this is remotely good, even by his standards. But nobody would ever dare tell him that in his millions, he was the one who made all of them. So the only person left embarrassed are those who actually try to defend this garbage, or anyone who was a fan is now seeing what Drake is sunk to making. Hacky Chuck Lore sitcoms would find this beneath them. It's it's a bad parody, it's not funny, and if Drake doesn't regret this hit now, he might as well down the line. Number four. So here's an interesting fact. As bad as Way Too Sexy is, it hasn't had a lot of staying power in Toronto, where I currently live, even though it was the number one hit. Didn't really have much more in comparison with Knife Talk, Fair Trade, No Friends in the Industry, and... Hate to say it, even girls like girls, they've gotten more play. And while Way Too Sexy is humiliating and embarrassing to anyone within its listening radius, everyone kind of gets that it sucks. If you like it ironically, that's on you. You can have it, but it's going to fade quickly and nobody feels sorry for anyone involved. Whereas with this one, yeah, it was bad right from the jump. But the true nature took its time to reveal itself. My Her friends and her mom hate me. Go. Lay down on the bed, do the cry, baby. Mm. She ain't gave me none of puss in a while. She had the boy wait, now I don't mind waiting. Oh, you ain't gonna respond to my text? Oh, yeah. Want me keep all my diamonds with sex? What's your name? The fact that this is one of Megan Thee Stallion's biggest hits off of good news in 2021 is infuriating. Not that that album was stacked with the obvious singles, it really wasn't. And the DaBaby feature meant, at the time, it was an obvious pick. Didn't stop it from being atrocious though right from the start thanks to the god-awful production Megan the Stallion's instrumentation has been hit and miss for years now it's a consistent problem but let's be real this was dead on delivery leaning on the ugly baby cry and the crummy mastering from the production from DA got that dope and a very thin concept of infantilization that's not just kind of gross but also doesn't fit Megan the Stallion's brazen in your face dominant adult personality at all if anything it feels like another attempt to work to baby's name into the gimmick of the song especially he's got the hook and the verse really does feel like his song and given that it's 2021 to baby that's a bad sign but even then that feels dated to at least three years ago when Lil baby was doing it and what we do get and what we wind up with as a result beyond a doubt is a song that neither rapper has any chemistry nor fun with it the baby is cranky that the girl's parents and friends don't like him can't imagine why given even outside of his fall off and contract controversies this year he names all the other women he's running through and not only does Megan not think any of this is cheating if she makes the rules and then actively derides someone for catching feelings but she doesn't even seem like she's having fun here either as she ends her verse telling him how to fuck her properly it's not sexy there's no tension that comes with a hate fuck it's just tedious it's annoying it makes me wonder why on earth Megan agreed to do it I can't imagine her playing it much now Nowadays, given that DaBaby placed his allegiance with Tory Lanez over her in the mother of all bad decisions. But hey, let's paraphrase George Carlin. Sometimes in a career, you wind up with a medical plan that includes abortion. This song deserved it. Number three. So last year I included a song on the very top of my list where I was describing a trend that was coming in mainstream music that embraced pop with a greater sense of ironic detachment. And then I got a lot of hasty proclamations of, no, 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 this truly shows how happy they are. They're finding contentment in rough times. You don't get it. And why do I feel like you're pissing on me and telling me it's raining? Especially as someone who has seen this particular run of insincere crap happen to pop before in the 90s and the 2000s. But 
it's going to be subjective whether or not you find it authentic or sincere. I'll give you that. Some people will take it at face value. You'll buy into it. Whereas some of us will see right through it and feel like if it's not already commodified, it's putrid in a really ugly, disquieting way. So, you know, if you have a cover of a song that was noted for how sincere and sweet and colorful it was, and then mutilated through the cheese grater of irony. You know, it's funny. This is the second cover that made this list. And it's of a song I don't even particularly like. The original by Kareen Bailey Ray, it's fine for what it is. A genuinely sweet song seeking its bliss that you either like or you don't care about. It's not quite my thing, but I get how and why it works. It's fine. So naturally, what you want is a preening white hipster who goes under the name Rit Momney after the rest of his band quit to turn into a trash fire of garbled pop trap that doesn't have anything close to the breezy charm of the original song. The frontman has described his version as manifesting happiness, which makes me want to manifest a fist through the nearest wall. But what's happy about taking the breezy acoustic pop soul of the original and stripping of any sense of momentum or organic groove, suffocate yourself in all this willowy auto-tune that is not the Bon Iver impression that you think it is with a worse falsetto somehow. And once you've got over the oversold percussion mix and lack of any sort of consistent tempo, you get the pitch shifted change up that makes me utterly convinced that this is taking the piss out of the original song. I'm sorry, it feels like someone who's making a based YouTube poop of the original. And you know, if it just stopped there, it would be awful, but I'd get it. But then you get into the, how the content has been changed by switching from a black girl singing about self-love and repair to a white guy singing to said black girl because it changes none of the pronouns and it comes across like he's playing for the hookup and it's just skeevy. It's presumptuous in a way that just turns my stomach. If it's being played earnestly, no, I'm sorry, it's a complete failure to capture the spirit of the original and becomes this tainted mess. Whereas if it is a troll, which feels a lot more honest to be what's being done to the song, I'm sorry, there's a different sort of scumminess here that feels like artistic vandalism without a cause. This was another song that only barely survived thanks to his long dead TikTok meme. I'm prepared to put this one back in the ground, where it belongs. Number two. And as we circle back for the most lingering, obvious embarrassment of 2021, I mean, come on, easy targets are here for a reason. Yeah, we fancy like Applebee's on a date night. Got that Bourbon Street stay with the Oreo shake and some whipped cream on the top two. Two straws, one check, girl, I got you. You can make a very good argument this is the worst song of 2021. I mean, it's playing for lightweight, jokey novelty, but Walker Hayes remains the most limited singer on Music Row, and he can't sell any of the slang that he's bastardizing. He's tried to keep it clean in order to hold on to the commercial endorsements, but that doesn't get around how the mingled food and sex references make this tacky and gross all the way down. From the Alabama jamma to squeak squeaking in the truck bed, a calling his girl double wide and dipping like fries in her frosting. It was just a fry, my man. Sounds like you've got much bigger problems. Might be a girth issue. Then there's that second Vespa reference to wind up on this year-end list. I feel like someone in their marketing division should get fired for this. And you know what? Add the heads of Monument Records to that as well. Not just for giving Walker Hayes some horribly flat country trap production that would embarrass Sam Hunt of all people, but also for leaving your only other act, Caitlin Smith, to be stranded in label purgatory after making two of the best pop country albums of the last five years because you can guess where all of her promo budget likely went but it was sadly the kesha remix which crystallized exactly why i despise this song not just for the deep-seated embarrassment of kesha doing whatever she can to make another hit and stooping to work with walker hayes but also because her brand of trashy doesn't even fit on this song her brand of it was always rooted in something that's kind of punk the outcasts the misfits the queer folks who live rough on the edges, those that capitalism left behind. Walker Hayes, meanwhile, makes music for the basic consumer, the overly defensive middle American everyman who is so firmly lodged in his basic comfort zone that he doesn't even notice or care about the grist mill of brand names circulating around him. The sort who probably would have laughed at all the bad jokes made at Kesha's expense a decade ago, and even despite everything that's happened since, 
they probably still do. In my Sam Hunt review, I highlighted how Music Row often gives its arsenal of interchangeable white boys the privilege to fail time and time again, because this is the success that they want. Congrats, America. You're just the ones who bought it. And finally, number one. So some of you might be asking why Fancy Like is not my number one here. I mean, it's the obvious pick. Sometimes the consensus is right on the money in more ways than one. I'm not trying to be contrarian. Well, there was a part of me that also realizes Fancy Like's a novelty song. I don't see that magic striking twice. Even Walker Hayes has admitted that. And while Hayes is playing for the most basic of consumer impulses, the song kind of feels like a bit of an outlier as a whole. I don't think Music Row can pull off another one of these, and God hope us that they don't try. But let's circle back to that concept of embarrassment. In many cases on this list, it has to do with the artists humiliating themselves when they can do a lot better, or the feeling of me trying to engage with the art and just feeling kind of mortified. But let's take a wider lens for a second. Because here's an uncomfortable truth about a lot of music criticism that you're not going to want to hear. As much of a lot of it can reveal a base dislike for a song or the artist behind it, I think we'd all be lying to ourselves if we don't admit that some of it spills over onto the audience that might like the material. Especially if the music aligns with a certain cultural mindset that we might disagree with, but they like. Now, I'm actually kind of mixed on whether or not that's a bad thing. Beyond the political angle, obviously you want to engage with art that challenges your worldview. But there is a note of truth. The subjective enjoyment captured within the in-group of stuff you like, or if folks get behind art you find reprehensible, you might question what that reveals, both about your own perspective and theirs. And of course, on some level, it's not that deep. You need to keep perspective. But if there's a song that made me want to run headlong in the opposite direction, yeah, I think it's this one. He's one of the good ones, and he's on Let me put a pin in the politics for now. The song sounds like trash. The electric guitars are drowned out in a wall of gauze. The vocal mix actively peaks. The percussion tries to build more presence, but the most prominent element is this tinny knock right at the very front. The acoustics are swallowed up in an attempt at bombast that's got no groove or punch to it. And for supposedly a love song, it feels so sterile and cold, lacking any sense of intimacy or greater warmth. Now, this is not helped by Gabby Barrett, who has pipes but no idea how to show any sense of subtlety or range. Not like this synthesis size train wreck would let her show it effectively, but even beyond the aesthetic choices that feel artificial in the worst way possible, it's the content that skeeved me out and it comes down to that central hook. He's one of the good ones. I mean, put aside the immediate dear future husband vibe that rears his ugly head. Even if Gabby Barrett is just singing about her fiance, there's something about her finding a hunk of Bible thumping white bread that feels like a fantasy without being sold as one that it is. I mean, Taylor Swift made her fair share of love struck fairy tales that work within that framing and are pretty damn good, but this is what that's taking to an entitled, weirdly presumptuous, and self focused view of. Of her partner, where she wasn't even looking to find him, and while wow, anyone can be good once, he's good all the time, and everyone can find one, just minus one. He's all hers. The perfect trophy. I mean, it feels like an antiseptic checklist, watching a girl defined video, and while every experience is one of his own, this is not a love that feels real to me. The sort of life plan connection that implodes on contact with reality. As Carly Pierce showed a great effect on this year on her album and it deserved a lot more hits. But now let's bring some of the known context back in. Beyond the conservatism that Gabby Barrett has openly showcased, when you realize just how the phrase, one of the good ones is often used, that weird stifling chill of the song becomes way more revealing. It makes my skin crawl, especially as to an surface audience given my own current situation. The song I could be described as one of the good ones, fitting a very prescribed role and set of beliefs that at their core fly in the face of the placid veneer that this is. It's inertia, but it feels toxic to its core. And if me calling that out makes me not one of the good ones anymore, more of a, well, well bad seed. You know what? God damn it. I'm just fucking fine with that. I, I've tried to engage with this worldview, and I don't like it pulling me in or trying to. Worst song of the year. 
I wish more people realized that. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. Again, this is probably plenty contentious. I know I put some songs in this list that I know people like. Comments are down there for you to express yourselves. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. I'd be greatly appreciative of it. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And hey, here's a new announcement. I actually have some merch. Yeah, it's been in the works for a while now. It's actually been publicly available on my website for a decent bit. But I'm going to promote it here for once because it's going to be one of my biggest videos of the year. If you want to go check it out, help support the channel, I'd be greatly appreciative. And hey, if you want to do this a more old-fashioned way, join my Discord, help my support my channel through Patreon, that option is also available. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.